Welcome to the first IFM webinar uh, on uh, IFM's healthcare activities. This webinar will focus on patient flow modeling and uh, resource demand prediction during the early parts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic based on work that we uh, conducted at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Uh, the project was led by my colleague, Dr. Ajit Palikad, who will lead the presentation in today's talk. Today's webinar uh, will cover just a few words about the Institute for Manufacturing. Then uh, Ajit will give a 20 to 25 minute presentation on patient flow and, and modeling. Uh, I'll then come back and say a few words about IFM's focus on healthcare, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, about the Institute for Manufacturing, well, the, the IFM is uh, part of the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. We have about 300 people conducting research, uh, education and practical application, uh, as well as about 120 taught course students. Our work spans management, so uh, topics such as innovation and operations, uh, government, government policy, such as around innovation, uh, and some specific technologies, uh, many of which are relevant not only to manufacturing, but also uh, to healthcare. Uh, this uh, research and practical application has had many uh, activities uh, with the healthcare sector over the last 15 years or so, uh, covering uh, healthcare operations, uh, the pharmaceutical sector, uh, research charities, uh, and so on. And so uh, we've got quite uh, a lot of experience now, both on the research side and the practical application side, uh, and working across uh, the healthcare ecosystem. And I suppose what uh, a key common theme across the healthcare of our activities has been enabling innovation across the healthcare ecosystem. Now, before we uh, kick off with the webinar, uh, please uh, feel free to pose uh, questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll attempt to uh, answer all of the questions uh, during the Q&A session towards the end. Any questions we don't get to, we'll try to uh, address in the follow-up communications to you directly. If you have any uh, technical challenges or, or support questions, uh, please use the uh, chat functionali fun functionality, which will go to the technical support team. Uh, and we'll be sending out a recording of the presentation to everyone who registered over the next week or so. So uh, if I can just hand across to uh, my colleague, Ajit. Whoops, sorry. Ajit, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Let me just share my screen here. Okay. Is that visible? Can you share, uh, see my screen? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Peter. Um, so my name is Ajit Parlikad. Um, I'm one of the uh, academics in the engineering department at um, the University of Cambridge. I'm going to talk about the work that we did with uh, Aaron Brooks Hospital during the early stages of COVID-19 and still ongoing work um, trying to help the hospital predict the level of demand that they might see uh, for, uh, for different kinds of resources due to uh, COVID uh, patient admissions. So this work started sometime in um, March, and this is part of a number of different activities that um, the Institute for Manufacturing um, was participating in, uh, in terms of helping Aaron Brooks cope with the, the, the surge of COVID patients in, in different aspects, um, um, ranging from uh, resource demand prediction all the way to organizing warehouses, uh, predicting stock availability, um, and so on and so forth. So this particular problem that um, uh, I was leading uh, really looked at uh, the, the problem that 
um, COVID-19 patients make use of very scarce resources within the hospital, such as ventilators. As a good example, you might have heard about uh, the scarcity of vent ventilators across the nation during the early stages of the pandemic. In addition to ventilators, there are other scarce resources, such as um, ICU beds, um, staff, um, oxygen, and so on, that the hospital was worried whether they might have enough resources to meet the impending demand. Um, the other problem was that the future of COVID-19 uh, admissions were very uncertain. There were, there were a number of scenarios that the hospital could play around with, but what uh, ultimately um, they would see uh, was very unclear. Um, and so, so and, and also from a capacity management point of view and planning point of view over the next um, two or three months, I'm talking from March, next two or three months, um, the hospital could really benefit from uh, data informed decision in terms of uh, managing capacity and demand. So the goal of this activity was to evaluate what level of demand um, we, we, would, we, would be, uh, we can expect to see in terms of the different uh, scarce resources for, for different kinds of scenarios for COVID-19. So um, the approach that we took is uh, the approach that we normally take in a similar manufacturing problem. If you want to um, uh, predict the, the, the level of demand for a particular resource, uh, um, the, the, the approach that we take, well, one of the approaches that we take is uh, discrete event simulation. So here as well, we, we developed a discrete event simulation of the, the, the patient flows through the hospital and used the discrete event simulation to predict what level of demand they would see at uh, for for different kinds of uh, resources so this is a snapshot uh, of uh, the the um, the uh, animation from the discrete event simulation model uh, it's it was uh, we built it using a popular software package called arena which is again a, a popular des um, specifically applied to uh, manufacturing um, uh, scenarios so the first thing we had to do in order to develop a good model is to understand how patients flow through the, the hospital. So COVID-19 patients flow through the hospital. So because it's a discrete event simulation, we wanted to identify what are the events that will happen throughout this, this journey, patient's journey. So the first event, for example, is the admission of that patient. And then after the patient is admitted, the patient the patient's um, um, stay at the hospital could take at least two pathways. One we call the complicated stay, where the patient gets admitted to a general ward, they get worse, and then they have to be transferred to an ICU. And from the ICU, some of the patients get better and they come back to the general ward. The other patients, uh, unfortunately, might pass away um, and some other patients might be transferred out of the hospital to, to some other um, nearby hospitals. Uh, once they are back in the general ward, uh, uh, the, the patients will then be discharged after a post ICU stay. Or they could have an uncomplicated stay where they come into the general ward um, and most of the patients, they get discharged after they get better. Very few patients we see, they can pass away um, uh, directly from the general ward as well. So we understood these um, patient flows um, and, and um, what we also then had to understand is at each stage of their stay within the hospital, what resources are they going to consume and how many of those resources are they going to consume? And more importantly, what would be the length of stay at each stage of their stay at the hospital? So that they formed some of the most important inputs to the, the model. So this, this kind of captures the, the inputs and the outputs that we were, we were trying to um, uh, gather and produce through this model. So some of the inputs, as, as I've said, length of stay, survival rates, um, and the pathways, how many, what proportion of patients have, uh, are likely to have a complicated stay, what proportion of patients are likely to have an uncomplicated stay, and so on. Um, if, when they are in ICU, or sometimes when they are in general wards, how much oxygen do they consume? And there are different kinds of oxygen uh, devices um, ranging from ventilators to simple oxygen masks, and they all consume oxygen at a different rate. 
and the hospital or any hospital will have an upper limit or capacity in terms of the liters per hour of oxygen that um, they, they can provide to the patient. So you might have heard news uh, during, I think, April or May that Watford Hospital in London uh, ran out of oxygen. But it's not, it didn't run out of oxygen. Uh, it didn't run out of oxygen. It was the, the, the oxygen flow rate that, uh, uh, that crossed the maximum limit. Um, so uh, in addition to that, uh, we also got from the hospital the uh, what, what they call a cohort planning. So the, of course, the hospital has a number of wards in general and uh, ICU. Um, they don't always open all of these wards to COVID patients all of, uh, at the same time. Of course, these wards will have other patients present um, at, the, at the early stages of the COVID uh, wave. So there was a plan to release the wards um, one by one to COVID patients when the needs arise. So, so the COVID planning uh, input took into consideration those the, the sequence of awards that will um, uh, be released to COVID patients. Um, and of course, ventilators and other resources, what other resources would we need? Um, the data collected from the hospital were uh, fit into probability distributions to provide as an input to the simulation model and the output from the simulation model were the uh, demand predictions on a day by day basis. And the good thing about the simulation model, as opposed to having a deterministic model, a spreadsheet based, for example, the deterministic model that the hospital was using at that time, is that the deterministic model will give you one number, say on Monday or on day 23, the, uh, the, the demand like, is likely to be 85 beds. Whereas what a simulation model can give you is because it is stochastic, because it, we are fitting probability distributions as input, it can give you a range. It can give you 95% confidence intervals, for example, uh, of what might be the demand that you would see on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis. So we, we got these inputs. So at the initial phase, um, um, the input, uh, we, of course, we didn't have that many um, COVID patients uh, in March and April. Um, so we had to depend on published figures from other countries, for example, Italy and China and so on. So that they formed our initial guesstimates about what would be the length of stay and what would be the death rate and so on and so forth. We built three scenarios. Uh, the base case being um, uh, that we would hit a peak of uh, 16 patients um, uh, per day. Um, uh, we, we used to, we, the medium case, which was based on what was happening in Italy with a 32 patients per day uh, basis. And, and we also modeled the worst case scenario with the 64 patients peak. Um, and, 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 and we also looked at uh, historical data uh, to understand what would be the hourly arrival patterns, what might be the hourly arrival patterns of patients uh, to, to, the, to the hospital. And uh, we, we based that on purely historical data. So that was the input and we got some initial insights to that. So in, in the early days, uh, so we modeled these three cases, uh, the base case, Italy case and worst case. And we tried to predict what would be the general bed occupancy, for example. So these graphs show for each of these cases what the general bed occupancy demand might be. Um, and, and the nice thing, so, the, so the, the green and the orange lines that you see here are the dem demand predictions. Uh, so that th those those are the the bed occupancy levels, and the the red uh, lines they show the bed availability levels. So as I said before, the wards are not completely open. All the wards are not open for COVID patients right at the start. So the wards get opened um, when the need arises. So there was a there was a rule that said, uh, that, that we used say when when the patients uh, hit a certain number and the number of remaining beds in the in the open wards. Uh, fall below a certain number, a new ward will be opened because, and we needed to make this um, decision in advance because it takes some time to open a, a ward uh, to 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 remove the patients that are already there in the ward and clean up and and prepare the ward for COVID uh, to to become a red ward. Um, so you can see on the on the, the left hand side of the curve, the the red uh, the capacity kind of tracks tracks the demand. Um, it it slightly leads the demand, um, but in a case where uh, the, there are high admissions uh, admission rates, the the policy of how many beds should be remaining when you open a new ward was um, 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 we had to determine an effective policy because if you use the same policy, you might actually run out of beds because patients are coming in at a very high rate. The interesting point to see here is the right hand side of the curve, where you see the capacity or the, the red ward um, capacity 
kind of trails behind the actual demand or the actual occupancy of the um, of the beds. That is essentially because, um, again, because of um, 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 medical reasons, uh, the hospital did not want to move patients from one ward to another. So a patient would remain in the same ward until they get discharged, which means that in some cases there might be a ward with only one patient in, but the entire ward is actually a red ward, which means um, there, if you're thinking about um, during this later half of the um, COVID pandemic, if you wanted to bring other patients back into the hospital, the amount of capacity left for other treatments were actually limited, even though you might actually see that there are not that many patients in the hospital, but then there's not enough capacity to get, take on non-COVID patients as well. And we could actually predict this using our simulation model. So that's this, this slide just, just highlights that the, the, the occupancy and the capacity um, kind of lags uh, between each other. Um, and because we modeled this at a, a ward level and the bed level, we could do this. Uh, so, so that those were the general ward um, predictions. And similarly, we did predictions for the ICUs um, uh, as well. And we could do this at individual ward level. So this is an example of a particular ward um, um, and uh, what, the, uh, what the, uh, um, um, the occupancy would be and whether the ward would be open or, or closed at which point in time. So here you can see that there's a bit of variability in terms of when the ward will be opened for COVID patients, but there's a lot of variability in terms of when the ward will be closed for COVID patients, which means it is open for non-COVID patients. Um, so that is something that hospitals will need to be really, really thinking about. And now, so that was the first wave. Uh, and then towards uh, uh, June, July, we, uh, the, the first wave got through. We got through the first wave. And uh, interestingly, Cambridge did not, or luckily Cambridge did not actually see even the, the base case numbers that we were predicting. So thankfully, um, uh, the, uh, there was no problem. Uh, the, 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 there was very little problem for, for the hospital in terms of uh, the demand for resources. So then some of our predictions for some other resources, which I haven't shown, uh, was pretty dire, for example, um, oxygen and even ventilators, because now the hospital has enough ventilators, but at that time we did not, or we didn't think we would have, but thankfully the numbers remained low. Now, when it hit, uh, now that we are uh, in uh, August, September, now what we are interested in is to look at what would happen in case of a second wave. So now the good thing is that now we have the ability to look at what happened in reality. So in where before our probability distributions, for example, were based on distributions, we was, uh, data that we were getting from China or Italy. Now we have real data from the hospital. So we can, got that real data from the hospital over the last three months and fit a probability distribution or fit a set of probability distributions that were fit for purpose for, for Cambridge. So it represents what happened here. So we changed the, the probability distributions and for validation sake, we thought, okay, let's run the, the, uh, uh, our simulation model with these numbers, with the actual admission numbers and the length of stay numbers. And would we get the, uh, would our model predict the um, bed demand, for example, uh, uh, as closely as possible as to what happened in reality? So if we compare the prediction of bed occupancy versus the real bed, bed occupancy over the three, uh, last three months, how close would that be? And interestingly, what we saw was that the, 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 uh, our simulation model with its uncertainty bands and so on, it, it pretty much really accurately represented what happened over the last three months. So the blue bars that you see, the, the error bars are the prediction, are 95% are confidence predictions. The red line captures the real bed occupancy in general ward and the ICU. And you can see that except for a few um, occasional cases, um, the, the red bar is entirely within the band of uncertainty that we predicted. Uh, for comparison, the, the yellow line is what a deterministic model without the stochasticities, without the uncertainties would actually give you. And we can see that the stochastic model is far better in predicting um, what happens in reality uh, than the deterministic model. So that gives us a level of confidence that the model that we've built is um, a fit for purpose. Now, what we are doing is to use this for predicting what will happen in the second wave. So again, um, working with the hospital, uh, we have um, developed three scenarios, uh, one being a suppressed scenario where very low number of cases, an intermittent lockdown scenario, which is 
probably what we are seeing, at least from a scenario point of view, but not from a numbers point of view, the daily admissions are still very, very low in Cambridge. And a worst case scenario, again, what will happen if we hit a peak of around 32 admissions uh, per day. Um, and we've done similar um, predictions uh, to, to help hospital plan for these three different scenarios. But what, what the hospital can also uh, do is to understand by looking at these simulations is how, when to actually switch from one policy to another. So if they, were, if they are currently planning for the, the base case, when should they start looking at um, um, uh, allocating beds for COVID uh, if, if, it, if it hits uh, a, a uh, Italy or medium case or the worst case and so on. So in addition to the beds uh, in general wards and ICU, we have also given predictions for oxygen demand. Um, oxygen looks okay, except if we hit the worst case scenario, then we might uh, cross the, the upper limit of 3000 liters per minute, but otherwise uh, it looks uh, uh, pretty good. And the other resources as well, ventilators and so on. So you can see the availability of ventilators were slowly ramping up through the, the first wave um, but now the capacity of ventilators is, it seems like sufficient, even in a worst case scenario for, for Allen Brooks. Similarly, we have predicted the mortuary capacity again, uh, it's, it seems fine. So, so for most of the, the resources that we've modeled, it looks like even in the worst case scenario, the hospital should be fine uh, for, for this. Um, so, so in, in con conclusion, what, what we have learned from here is that when we are modeling these, um, um, uh, these patient flows and using such models to predict demand, we really need to consider local specifics. So we, we had a drastic change in our predictions when we used our local numbers versus when we used um, the numbers from Italy or China. Um, and, and it was clear that st such stochastic modeling is very useful for the hospital. Uh, to identify which resources need to be searched up and then do they need to be, to be searched up uh, during a, a pandemic wave like, like this. Um, and stochastic modeling is uh, helpful to uh, understand which resources are likely to become a bottleneck for, for a given scenario. And finally, this is a piece of work that we are currently doing um, to understand how these models can help the hospital prepare for different scenarios, but also ensure the right balance of resources between COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 care. So for example, in the, early, uh, in the first wave, all elective surgeries were canceled by the hospitals across the country. Now, when we hit a second wave, do we do the same thing? Or how can we effectively provide a balance of resources between elective surgery and COVID care, because they, they essentially, they use the same similar kinds of resources. They use ICUs, they use critical care staff and so on. So how do we uh, share the resources between the two uh, sets of patients? So hopefully that was useful. Uh, a few uh, acknowledgements for the people that um, we were working with at, at, at Adam Brooks. A number of people were key in providing us with the right kind of data, helping us understand how the hospital works and the patient flows work and so on. There were a group of students um, uh, and three of them mentioned here, in addition to the two students I mentioned earlier uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in my title page, were really critical in um, um, enabling us to develop this model. Uh, a few PhD students were also involved in terms of data analysis, probability distribution fitting and de developing the, these visualizations, the graphs that I've shown, shown, shown you and so on. They're quite powerful to, to, to help the management really understand the, the, the scale of the problem. So I'll stop here. Um, hopefully uh, that gave you a clear picture of uh, our work with Adam Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, and is that uh, sharing? Hmm. You can see your desktop. Ah. Sorry, there we go. Excellent, thank you. Um, so just a few words on uh, uh, the IFM uh, approaches to uh, healthcare and our experience over re recent years. O over the last 15 years or so, we, we've worked with uh, a broad range of organizations uh, across the, the healthcare ecosystem. So for example, uh, research funders, uh, researchers, innovators, uh, various industry sectors, and 
uh, healthcare operations. Um, the, with research funders, our uh, focus, I suppose, has been uh, using techniques uh, such as road mapping for helping uh, funding organizations to uh, identify where they wish to uh, focus th their um, funding investments in, in medical research to develop visions of uh, the future and then to uh, work out how those visions will be realized, engaging a broad range of stakeholders so they achieve consensus not only about the vision, but it's a uh, it, uh, path for getting there. Uh, we, we work with uh, researchers, uh, both on the clinical side, but also on technology side, to look at uh, research in complex uh, uh, treatment areas, for example, uh, hard to treat uh, cancers. And the idea there is to use a strategic technology and innovation management methods to bring together the, the different uh, research disciplines and again uh, develop a, a, a vision of uh, how uh, the, the, the particular condition should be approached and the, how the, the research disciplines can work together to achieve that over the project life cycle. Um, moving along the uh, research translation uh, life cycle, we work with uh, innovators and research translation organizations uh, to, to help develop, for example, uh, business models that draw on both medical uh, research, but also technologies like wearable devices, um, data analytics, and, and, and so on, to uh, address uh, or to bring together the, those medical sciences and the technologies into something which is operable at, at scale. Uh, we've worked with industry, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in supply chains, uh, in uh, manufacturing um, investments, and in R&D. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a few moments. Uh, and then finally, as Ajit has indicated, uh, we, we've worked with uh, uh, healthcare operations such as uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital uh, on a, a range uh, of issues, some uh, related to COVID, um, and others, uh, things like, uh, for example, uh, brain trauma using road mapping methods and ecosystem uh, map methods to uh, identify how best to uh, take new interventions forward. So this diagram is a uh, representation uh, of the pharmaceutical uh, supply chain and illustrate some of the work that my research colleagues have been undertaking uh, across the, the pharmaceutical supply chain. So there's been a big uh, project uh, conducted with uh, GSK and AstraZeneca uh, and I think about uh, 30 smaller um, companies in the pharmaceutical supply chain looking at things like uh, how can we better uh, provide uh, supply to clinical trials, uh, looking through manufacturing uh, uh, both at the primary level and at the secondary level, and then uh, through distribution and use. And so we've done some interesting uh, work with a healthcare provider, um, uh, sorry, a, a pharmaceutical uh, uh, pharmacy provider to automate the uh, packing, picking, packing and distribution of, of uh, individual prescriptions across a pharmacy uh, retail network. So uh, I hope that gives a sense of the breadth of what we uh, have been doing. Uh, I'll now uh, uh, stop sharing my screen and we can move on to the question and answer session. Ajit, are you uh, ha happy yes. <laughs> to take some questions? Yeah. Uh, so I, the, the first question is, um, uh, the IFM isn't a really obvious place for a hospital to go for this kind of uh, support. How, how did the relationship start? So, um, thanks, Peter. Uh, um, as you mentioned, uh, the IFM 
although has a, a big focus on manufacturing and manufacturing industries, um, it has been working in the healthcare sector with the healthcare sector and partners within the healthcare sector for some time on, on other, other matters. However, uh, how this came about is really um, when, when um, the pandemic struck, um, we, within a, 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 the IFM, a group of academics, we got together and we, we, we started challenging ourselves and by asking what, do, what skills do we actually have that we can actually offer to the hospital uh, in addressing, in helping the hospital address some of the challenges that they might face. At that time, we didn't, we didn't even know what challenges they might face, they're they going to face. But we had an idea uh, because like, like any supply chain issues, any manufacturing problems, there's a huge level of demand that, is, that we are predicting. So which means that there might be a scarcity of resources, right? So the, the, some, some things were logical to, for us to understand. So we sat and said, okay, so, so then I said, yeah, I, I have some skills in developing simulation models. I teach simulation for our undergraduate um, students. And using that, we would be able to predict um, the, the demand for different resources. And similarly, other academics came and said, I have this skill that I can offer. So we went to Adam Brooks. Um, we have contacts at the, at the hospital. We talked to them and said, these are the skills that we have. If you need help with any of this, let us know. And well, the hospital said, yes, please do everything. <laughs> so so um, it was actually a, a, a great pleasure to, to, to spend that time um, really learning about how healthcare works and, and so on. Because I, for instance, had no idea about how a hospital works other than an occasional visit um, to the AME with my little son. Um, I never had the, the chance to really see it in, in depth. So, so it was a learning experience for me, but very rewarding. Thank you. Uh, a, a second question. Um, you, you indicated that you haven't really worked with, with hospitals uh, before. What, what were the, some of the challenges uh, that you've faced in, in the project? Yeah. So, as I said, um, we, I've, I've worked with a number of manufacturing companies, but never with a hospital. But what uh, probably helped me was to just uh, uh, step back and view this problem as a, from a systems thinking point of view, to really see this as a systems problem, really understand what is it that is coming into the system, what is it that is consuming resources within the system, and what what is happening within the system and how this, uh, um, um, uh, things go flow out of the system. So, so really understanding uh, the, the problem from a systems point of view, the interactions between the different entities within the system and the components of the system really helped me in, in um, approaching the problem in the way that I approached. Essentially, when I broke it down to its elements, it was very simple um, uh, and very, very much like a manufacturing problem. So in a manufacturing plant, you would have parts come in, they would consume certain resources like machinery and uh, staff and so on. And they will get assembled into some kind of product and they will then flow out of the plant. And similarly, in this case, we replaced parts with patients and we replaced mm -hmm. machines with beds and, um, and operators with uh, hospital staff. So the translation was not as difficult as we thought it would be, but at the very beginning, it seemed like a challenging and daunting task. Thank you. Um, can you say something on, on, about the, the changing data environment? Um, I mean, treatments are changing and, uh, and uh, we, we've seen treatments change e even just over the last few months with COVID. Uh, and so uh, the changes are uncertain, demand's very uncertain. Uh, and could you give some thoughts on modeling to increase, uh, to increase robustness? Yes. So um, um, definitely. And that's something that we saw over um, the last three, four months as well. Um, as I said, we started with um, data from completely outside Cambridge, um, outside the UK. And as we were getting data within the UK and within Cambridge, we st slowly started including the new data into our probability distribution models. So, so and, and moving into the future, what we would like to have in place is a continuously learning kind of an algorithm which actually updates the model parameters as we get new data. Now, there's another additional question posed there, which is when, what happens when 
the scenario completely changes. Say, for example, we have new medications and new treatments, which might mean, say, with remdesivir, for example, it might mean that the length of stays that we have seen so far might be cut drastically, maybe by 50%, right? So, so what we are doing there is to start with, again, approach this from a scenario point of view. So what if remdesivir cut the uh, length of stay by 50%? What if it cut the length of stay by only 20% or maybe 70%? And then see that in these three scenarios, what demand are you likely to have? And then as we as patients go through, as patients get this treatment and as we actually collect real data, that gives us the opportunity to then build that into a proper model. Thank you. Um, where, where does this uh, research go now? Um, it... Yeah, um, so a few um, pathways. So there are two things. One is where does this work go with Adam Brooks? Um, and and there, will be a, there will be an element of ongoing support as, as the, the previous question um, stated. Scenarios could slightly change. Um, the length of stays that we saw in the first wave might not be the same as the second wave. The first wave might be predominantly elderly population and the second wave might be younger population. We don't know. So there's a, there's a element of ongoing support for the hospital as uh, so that's practical work. From a research point of view, the way I'm taking this forward, um, my, my research interest is in the use of data and digital technologies to, to manage um, assets and infrastructure. So what, where I am taking this to is we've developed the capability to simulate the processes within the, the hospital. And this fundamentally is the, the foundation of what we call digital twins. So my question here from a research point of view is how can data and better use of digital technologies be used to develop these so-called digital twins, which can um, result in better patient outcomes. So how can these, these concept of digi digital twins help us better manage the facility and hence better provide patient, better patient outcomes. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, unless there are any, any further questions, um, I, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, participating in, in the webinar and uh, to thank Ajit for uh, a very interesting, informative uh, presentation. Uh, so at this point, I think uh, we, we'd like to uh, draw things to a close and thank everyone.